Golden Spiral Media presents The Blacklist Exposed. Hello, special agents. You have come to the right place. Welcome to The Blacklist Exposed. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. We are here with a special edition of The Blacklist Exposed with our Season 1 Special Archive Episodes. The following episode appeared on the TV Talk Network for Season 1 of The Blacklist, and we're bringing it to you here on The Blacklist Exposed, remastered and used with permission from TV Talk. We hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy this special episode from Season 1. You're tuned in to TV Talk, The Blacklist. Welcome to TV Talk, America's number one TV talk show network. And now it's time for TV Talk, The Blacklist. So long, FedEx. So long, UPS. There's a new delivery man in town whose packages I will return to sender. Welcome to TV Talk, The Blacklist. I'm Troy. And I'm Dave. And today we discuss The Courier, episode number five of this first season of The Blacklist, airing October 21st, 2013. And we have some great things to discuss tonight. We have, of course, the continuing saga of Tom and Lizzie and what their relationship is going to look like going forward. Yes, and then we also have an NSA agent who's trapped in a box. And, of course, he got in that box because the courier, the blacklist man himself for this evening, somehow put him in there because he wanted a good handsome sum of money. Yes, and we learn even more information about Red's personal connection with a lot of things, but in particular with the Cairo mishap. Yeah, which ties directly into the courier this evening. Really great opening this evening, actually. It was something a little bit different than what we've seen in the past. It was really intriguing to find out where this was going to go because Tom was kind of scary a little bit in that opening bedroom scene. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, like you said, a little bit of a different opening. We have been opening up with our introduction to the main bad guy. But today we opened up with a little bit of a personal moment between Lizzie and Tom. And then things kind of took a a little bit of a creepy turn. Yeah, I mean, she's definitely having a rough week. But to think that you'd have crazy dreams like this, the scarier thing I think would be like, have you ever talked in your sleep when you had one of these bad dreams? Yeah, especially when, you know, the type of information that they're holding from one another or supposedly holding from one another. Uh, A little bit of pillow talk could lead to some bad situations. Yeah, crying out your husband's name, but screaming it instead is kind of a different (laughs) turn of events. That's for sure. We are led into a uh, a pretty major confrontation in the bedroom, but it turns out it's all a dream, as you mentioned, which actually takes us to real life. Does he get some big news from Tom? Yeah, the big news is that someone's watching you get dressed when you get up in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly. But it turns out that he's also been working with the surrogate and it looks like everything's a go. They're going to go ahead with this surrogate adoption and he has a big ultrasound scheduled. I can't believe with everything that's happened. I mean, you know, people breaking into his apartment, stabbing him and putting him in the hospital. Lizzie's never home doing this crazy job. It's why are they going to continue forward with the child? Hard to say. Uh, maybe it's just to so Tom can keep up a cover of normalcy. Maybe, maybe, maybe he has to really keep up a cover of some yeah. kind. Absolutely. But we're also at this moment treated to the return of Mr. Apple Eater. He's back. Yes. And I hope we can keep calling him Mr. Apple Eater for the rest of the season because I don't <laughs> want him to have a name. Well, they keep the apple there. The apple is prominent. I mean, uh, it's the first one of the first things we see when they pull back. So now the great thing about the courier is that, of course, you know, he's going to be shipping a package. So we cut over to the woods and we see him basically boxing up some poor sap with some like, you know, 20 something kid who probably was just having a bad prom night or something before he got over. Yeah, to the he, he kind of looks like a pizza delivery guy, doesn't he? Yeah, it's like, uh, the- <laughs> did you forget the pepperoni or something? <laughs> but it's an elaborate boxing. I mean, there's air tanks and gas masks and all kind of things going on. And I didn't know that it was going to be oxygen at first. I thought maybe he was piping him some kind of drug to be inside the box and had to ship him before the drug ran out or something. But that might have been a different kind of sci-fi X-Files or fringe type show instead. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, we are left with a rather terrified 
young man buried alive and we really don't know what's going on at this point. But he does a really great job of a trying to attempt an escape by stabbing him in the, the courier in the heart. <laughs> what? And I just kind of sat there and I was like, did he just kind of like shrug that off? Like, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, he really did. It was like nothing even happened. I mean, that's a superpower I would like to have if this was actually a superhero show. You know, just take a knife to the chest and be able to walk away with nothing <laughs> happening. <laughs> but that's kind of the end of our of our opening scene. You know, that's where things are kind of left, and we move on to our friend, Mr. Red Reddington. Yeah, and Red's got a lot of background information on what's all going down here with this guy, the courier. He basically gives him the modus operandi. He says, you know, if you basically mess up how this deal is going to go down, both parties end up dead. So he's pretty much laying it all out on the table that this courier guy – you know, he means business and no one is going to catch him. Right. And he doesn't want to deal with this guy. He, he decides to hand this off to the FBI rather quickly. He don't, he don't want to mess with this guy. So this is what I want to find out. You know, so we don't know how Red operates to begin with, right? And then Red seems to just kind of move around and just squat in whatever home that's been foreclosed on he can find. <laughs> yeah. And this time he's in an old apartment of apparently some, non-published writer who he befriended the guy the story goes something like he was working as a waiter in a restaurant that red frequented he took a liking to him and he set him up in this apartment and then the guy up and died red has kept the apartment as it was yeah so he talks to lizzie and basically says that the deal's going to go down in three hours so this is the first episode where there hasn't been some kind of precursor to prove red's worth so we jump right into the main storyline tonight. I wonder if that's going to change going forward and we're going to get right into the action as the rest of the season continues. What do you think? Do you like the change in format? I, I personally, I do. I was getting kind of tired of that. I mean, I know we're only a couple episodes in, but I was already growing weary of that. I kind of like the more kind of direct approach that we went with this week. And it was a little bit more of a buildup, too. We got introduced to a whole bunch of characters. Javi Sarouche, as I think what the name was. And yes. then, of course, he is trying to broker a deal with a Lauren de Chambou, I think is how I picked up the French lady's name. Exactly. And that turns out that that's who the courier had picked up the pizza guy from the French lady the, and was to deliver them to this Havai Sarouche character. The great thing about how this all went down, I mean, it's just like you want to pick your fruits and vegetables. <laughs> So, you know, if you're at the farmer's market, you're trying to get a nice cut of beef. And then, of course, you know, always great to have a side of ketchup via a bullet to the head. Yes, exactly. And uh, in a rather shocking turn of events, uh, that's exactly what happens. They do find this Sarisha, Liz and the crew take off to this market. They've got everything staked out. And before anything can really happen... Mr. Sharoosh has a bad day. Yeah, I mean, and the thing that I love about the Blacklist so far is that every single chase scene that they've done seems like it's really done in real life, right? No green screen, no special effects. And if they're doing it, their visual effects that they're implementing are just totally awesome because that car chase and the crash and everything... Very realistic, including the airbag deployment. Everything went off great there, and our courier escapes down an alleyway with uh, Lizzie hot in tow. Yeah, so uh, instead of put your hands up, it's lift your arm up and hold it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but before that happens, we see his courier cut open his chest, and he inserts this data card into a like a pocket that's sewn actually sewn into his chest. Listen, I'm so glad I watched this on the East Coast feed instead of the West Coast feed because if I was eating dinner at this time, it would not yeah. have been a good thing. W it wouldn't be good, but it's quite evident at this point that this guy, he feels no pain. I don't know if he's drugged or what's going on, but he, he ain't feeling any pain. Yeah, totally abnormal to say the least. And of course, that leads us into Red giving Harold some information when they're actually interrogating him that... Ah, the rumors are true. This guy definitely feels no pain whatsoever. So I wonder what kind of hidden objects that you might find inside this dude's body. Right. They call a, a doctor into the interrogation room and he comes and he's like, you know, I, I've heard of this condition, but I've never actually seen it. And he rattles off this medical condition, which I'm sure if we looked it up is probably a true medical condition. But when push comes to shove, this guy feels absolutely no pain. The brother is brought in from prison, and this is one thing in the plot line this evening that I kind of had a little bit of a quiff with because I, I just didn't know, 
you could see that they had an intent to use him, but again, just as they're about to use him to get the information out to go find where the kid is buried, you know, they have the guy, of course, escaping out of the back of the van. So what was the point of the brother this evening? Did he have any purpose? Well, I think it was just to show that they're kind of grasping at straws. I, do, I think they were looking for any lead they could possibly get. This was not an episode where there was really a lot of information provided uh, about these things. And I, it just showed them grasping at any straw they could. Lizzie finds that picture of the courier and his brother. And, you know, it appears that that might be the only soft spot he has. I thought that was a cover of a Brian Adams album, Summer of 69 or something like that. <laughs> Summer of 61, I think it said. Summer of 61 was what was said on the back. So uh, in this career on that flash drive, they actually find the videotape of this kid that was taken. Turns out he's an NSA analyst. Yeah, and he's a pretty bright analyst, too. One of the only three people that can break some kind of secret code. So if they can obviously purchase him, you know, they could basically bring down the government. Right. So they order an ultrasound to find what else this guy has hidden in his body. Lizzie can, goes and confronts Red for the truth about the courier. She knows Red knows more than he's saying. Right. And of course, Red wants to meet with, you know, all of the people that he's worked with before. So he wants to go find out where the kid might be buried by going and asking DeChambeau herself at a club that she has in town. So they kind of concoct this plan and it's based solely on the fact that they probably figure that this French lady, uh, I can never say her name, I apologize, has never actually met the courier. So they're going to send a wrestler in to play the courier and let her tell him that the deal's gone sour and everything's off and they're thinking she'll rush to go unbury the kid. I was hoping for a little bit of comedic relief this evening, you know, because he sits there in front of the French lady and he literally just takes that knife or whatever it was, the piece of glass and like cuts his arm open and he's like, look at me, I bleed for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I am awesome and I do not wince in pain and then literally have the whole thing go south and then have him run outside and go, my arm hurts. <laughs> <laughs> It would have been an interesting twist. I'll give it that much. <laughs> no, but alas, he escapes and runs away with it. You know, I, I don't understand how he's like able to do it. You know, he basically is getting the crap kicked out of him last week, and then he figures out a way to still pull it off. And then this week, he's got blood gushing out of his arm, basically almost slitting his wrists in theory. And then he takes out like four guys on the way in order to run out the front door. Dude's an animal. Exactly. He is it. He, the, the guy's a beast. He's a beast. That's what he is. While all this is going on, then you have Tom sitting at home, you know, still not back at work or doing whatever he's doing and looking at an empty hole in the floor and basically telling Lizzie, you got to come home because we need to talk now. Yeah, this is not a good development for Lizzie. And obviously she doesn't know why he's calling. Uh, Lizzie's wrapped up with what's going on at work. And he is adamant that she needs to come home. They need to talk. And we that's exactly what we see. We see him staring down into that hole in their apartment. What was your first reaction when you saw the hole? Oh, crap. <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> well, I thought the box actually had been stolen or moved at first. And that's why Tom was kind of pissed off, it seemed. because Yeah, because you don't really see it. You don't see the box. You just see the dark hole. So Yeah, and the way he made the look on his face about having to talk now, you know, it made it look like he was like, oh, man, who stole my box? You know, but we find out later, of course, that maybe it's not his box after all. Right. So in the meantime, we're back at the French lady. They bring her in. That whole thing goes bust and they're not able to get the information they need. The courier is being transported while this is all going down. Right. And of course, anytime you transfer a bad guy who can basically stick his entire escape plan down his throat, you know, <laughs> it all, always means escape. I, I got to remember, yeah. remember that trick to become a magician, the old puking up the handcuff key trick. Yes, absolutely. But he manages to get away and he's out on the run again. So then they figure out a way that Red can convince the FBI to figure out how to release the French lady so that she can go on her own because Red and her have some kind of a history together. Something about fleeing in Paris and we'll always remember Paris. I think that the best line of the night, though, comes when you have old Harold and Red having their nice conversation together. And Harold goes, if you screw me on this, and then Red, of course, responds with, I'll consider it a bonus. Red convinces the FBI to let her go, that the only way that he, they're going to be able to get the information is if she's let go. So it leads to this great scene where Red basically just scares the living 
crap out of her, letting her know basically the courier is not going to let her live. Right. And then, of course, they come back to the FBI. They try to figure out where this shack or the body is going to be buried. And then, of course, a gunfight ensues because the courier has returned to the scene of the burial and pretty much is... Almost, I don't even know. It was like Night of the Living Dead or something. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm not 100 percent sure what happened here. I ain't gonna lie to you, but there is this. There's a big gunfight. He escapes, and they stop him. And he appeared to me to have a heart attack. Right, and as they turn around, it looked like he might have gotten a bullet to the head. But of course, since he feels no pain, he just kind of kept on walking until he finally, you know, just gave out. Why don't you guys let us know? You know, you press the talk back button and even share any comment that you want right in the app. So do you think that he just had a heart attack? Do you think he was shot in the head? Do you think he died of something else? Maybe just pure boredom because he just keeps getting hurt and he doesn't really feel any pain and it kind of sucks for him. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, just push the uh, talk back button there in the center of the app and just let us know how you think the courier finally bit the bullet. No pun intended. <laughs> but the bad news is for our buried agent is time is running out. The courier was kind of their last best hope of finding him. And now we're down to only 30 minutes of air left and they don't know where this guy is. Of course, it's the traditional, you know, kind of, oh, look at all these woods. There's only one access road. They must be here. Right. Kind of kind of didn't like that kind of play this evening myself. Seemed yeah. Too but- easy. Yeah, it, it really, truly was. And then even more so, uh, Red and her head out, and Red just magically figures out, oh, he liked to bury things in his body, so he must have buried this guy. Of course, easily finds the hole where the agent is buried. But this is the thing that makes the blacklist awesome, because even though they played off on the, oh, there's only one access road, he has to be here, then when they finally get to the spot, it's nothing but refrigerators and <laughs> file cabinets and like you're just sitting there going okay he's probably buried underground how are they going to move all this metal fast enough and then dig to find out where the guy actually is buried right but they saved the day they uh, unbury the guy it turns out he was actually buried in a freezer the guy's not breathing so the best part of this show though always comes with like the last five minutes and there was just Almost an entire episode worth of things happening right before the closing credits. So he's talking to this new guy. I'm trying to figure out if this guy that was talking with right in the apartment, if he was the original guy in the opening scene back in the pilot that said, hey, is it good to be home? Trying to see if that's the same person. I don't know if you caught that at all, Dave. I, I just assumed it was, to be quite frankly honest. But I'd actually have to go back and rewatch the first episode and see. But I just assumed that's who he was. He, I mean, he comes across almost like a, a butler or a handler of some type. A Mr. Belvedere. Would be. <laughs> Mr. Belvedere, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but he's uh, basically talking to Red, and they're having this conversation about, you know, so you got the NSA guy to give you access to the system, so you could have basically furthered your operation any way you wanted, and instead you decided to get this redacted report for Lizzie. Why did you do that? He says he's uh, betting on the long play, that the circumstances are much more complex than he could possibly know, which I think we've already figured out at this point. The more he keeps saying that the situation is complex and the question is as hard as the answer, you know, I think it's just driving home the fact that there is some kind of familial tie. Familial? I can't say that word. <laughs> some kind of family tie to Lizzie whether it's uncle, whether it's father, again, we we aren't sure just yet, but there is something bonding the two of these characters together, and he's basically betting on the future, and of course, Mr. Belvedere says, your future is arriving now. Right, and in walks Lizzie in tears because she's read this redacted report, which showed a picture of Tom, her husband, leaving the premises, and basically the report's states that the person in that photo is the person of interest in this person's death. So she now, in her mind, has the evidence that her husband is involved in something shady. Now, I take a ton of just random pictures with my iPhone, you know. I mean, could it just be that he happened to be walking out of the hotel to go get some Starbucks or something? Well, well absolutely, because they, they admit to being there. I mean, supposedly he was there on a, on a job interview, so it really showed nothing other than the fact that he was there. Right, exactly. But if somebody tied the picture to the words, and it makes it true. You know, must have found it on the Internet, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Lizzie states to Red, I, I don't even know why I'm here. To me, it was it was rather obvious that she's beginning to feel a closeness to Red, even though she hates it. 
she she realizes that Red's trying to help her. So we almost feel like at the end we're going to get some answers of who the spies are, we'll call them, I guess, Mr. Apple Eater's crew. And he's like, oh, my gosh, you're going to want to see this. Like, it's the best television ever. <laughs> and, of course, Liz comes home to confront Tom. And Liz actually starts out with the we need to talk. Yeah, and he says, funny you would say that. I was about to say the same thing. And he pulls out the box. So that leads us to the talk back question of this week. So if you're Tom, what is the first words out of your mouth when the show resumes next week? What do you think Tom is going to say, Dave? Boy, uh, I don't know. I, I really, really don't know. I'm going to be very curious to find out. And I'm also curious to find out what our listeners think. I, I really don't know. I, I, I think personally, I think I'm beginning to think Tom is being set up. That's what I'm thinking, too, because the first thing I thought of when he pulled the box out was that he was going to say, hey, why do you have this box? But then I remembered that his passport photos are in there inside the box in, the, in those passports. So I think he's going to be like, why are you framing me or why are you using me in your cases? Might be the next thing that comes out of his mouth. But we're going to wait and see what you all think. So answer that talk back question right there via the TV Talk app. Push the area right in the center of the listen screen and leave your comments. And be sure to share with your friends on Facebook and Twitter because it's a great weekly prize drawing this week. You could be entered to win an Apple TV. And if you're not listening to the show via the TV Talk app, well, you're missing over half the show. So head on over to tvtalkapp.com, download the app, and you can listen to all the details that come from all the fans of the show. Stay tuned. The talk back clips for this week are coming up next. And be sure to join us next week with Troy here and Dave here breaking down all the action on TV Talk, The Blacklist. And now it's time for this week's talk back clips. We hope you enjoyed this special version of The Blacklist Exposed, previously aired on the TV Talk Network and used with permission. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right we are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.